Well, last week we began a new sermon series, kind of a takeoff on a series that we had done last spring. You might remember, Things I Wish Jesus Would Never Have Said. So this time around, we pastors flipped that sentence on its head and asked ourselves, what are some of the things that we wish Jesus would have said, or at least said more about? Pastor Greg kicked off the series last week as he explored what Jesus had to say or not about the role of women in general, and more specifically, in the church. We were reminded that although the society of that day was entrenched in patriarchy, and Jesus didn't say quite enough for some of us, there are many places where Jesus' actions clearly rubbed up against those of society and sent a more egalitarian and affirming message. While we women who are clergy look forward to annual conference this July, where we will celebrate 60 years of ordination for women in the Church of the Brethren, we are painfully aware that many churches will interview only men for the pastorate. I am grateful for this congregation and for my supportive colleague who articulated accurately and fully affirmed the role of women. And we were reminded that men need to say, That's not right when there is inequality. It's a both and. Women need to speak out to tell their stories, and men must, must speak out and support. And so it is, not only with sexism, but with all the other isms that divide us, including racism, which we are looking at more closely today. It's a both and. Those who are being discriminated against have important stories to tell and truth to speak, and we need to make space and we need to listen. And those of us with privilege and power need to speak out and clear, loud and clear, and say, that's not right. This morning and the next two weeks, we want to try something a little bit different with these sermons also. We think that the themes lend themselves to further dialogue, for sure. And actually, um, we hope that all of our services lend themselves to further dialogue. But we'd like to do, after the sermon this morning, is to open up the conversation with, and, and allow you the opportunity to give some feedback. Uh, perhaps we'll ask a question um, and ask for your reflection. It's a time to share what this theme is stirring in you. So stay tuned. Several years ago, I was reading some anti-racism materials that were produced by our church. There I learned that merely because of who I am, because of the color of my skin, and because of where I live, I am a racist. Well, at first, I bristled. I had hoped that I was somewhat enlightened and definitely open-minded. But racist? Surely not. But then, in my exploration, I discovered that I am a person of white privilege. To be white in America is to benefit from a system of power and privilege, whether or not one has ever uttered a racist thought or committed a racist act. By accepting power as a birthright, white people enjoy the benefits and rewards of what their racist forefathers and foremothers left them. I, like many of us, have, presumed, have a presumed greater social status. I have been granted freedom to move, buy, work, play, and speak freely. I did not have to teach my children that for their own safety, they should never enter a store with their hands in their pockets. And it's okay for them to wear their hoodies with the hoods up, but not for everyone. It might be tempting for us to say, I don't see color when I look at other people, but racial colored blindedness does just the opposite. Folks who enjoy racial privilege are closing their eyes to the experience of others, looking at the uniqueness of the other, overlooking the uniqueness of the other, and the richness that diversity brings, their history, culture, pain, the injustices of racism endured. And so this morning, I come with far more questions than I have answers. I'm not an expert on racism, and this feels like a very heavy responsibility. Racism is so deeply rooted and complex that it's difficult to know how to even begin to address it in one short sermon. But it's important that we continue to make space 
to talk about it together. This has been an emotional week. I've been horrified at the evil that drives racism, saddened by the pain that it causes, felt great remorse when I have added to that pain in any way. I do, however, come with a deep conviction, a conviction that God loves every child, woman, and man, regardless of their ethnicity or skin color, and how we live into our belovedness and how we value that belovedness in the other matters, mon, mon, matters momentously, and therein lies our hope. We don't find the word racism or racist in Strong's Concordance of the Bible. The word didn't exist as such. It doesn't mean that Jesus was silent on what we now know as racism, but he didn't explicitly use that word. And that can create ambiguity for us as we try to understand. There are a few scriptures that, when plucked out of their context or read literally, might lead us to believe that Jesus didn't, at best, speak against racism. In Matthew 22:36, Jesus quotes the Hebrew tenet, love your neighbor as yourself, as recorded in Leviticus. The word used for neighbor is reacha and actually means fellow Jew. Some scholars would argue that Jesus was telling his followers to be kind to their own kind. Most likely, however, it was not a mandate to treat others poorly as much as they treat each other better. Perhaps this was an effort to mold the identity for the Jewish people. Another place in scripture, Jesus used the institution of slavery in his teaching, drawing a contrast between those in bondage and those free. Found in the Gospel of John, Jesus, it seems, didn't repudiate slavery, rather used it to illustrate another point. Again, it might have left people thinking that he didn't denounce slavery. The Bible can be very confusing and even misleading. When studying, it's so important to take into consideration that it was written in several ancient languages, many of which don't translate easily into English. And it took place in a very different land, and it took place a long, long time ago. Society has evolved in many ways over the millennia, and we live in a very different world. So rather than pulling a few random texts for proof texting that could potentially give us an inaccurate and even dangerously wrong understanding of what was intended, I'd like to look again at what might be a very familiar story and what new it offers us about anti-racism. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he, they, he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This scripture came to mind specifically for two reasons. 
First, unlike proof texting, this story offers congruency in what we know of Jesus' teachings and his living. And secondly, Dr. King often referred to this very parable of the Good Samaritan. He claimed the par parable allows us to examine the obligations owed to one another, regardless of race or any other factor that might divide us. It has often been thought that Samaritans and Jews were all but enemies, but there is scholarly evidence that the animosity was not as strong as it sometimes is assumed. Jews were suspicious of Samaritans as a people, similar yet different, something like we experience in our communities today. In this story, the Samaritan serves as a role model. His first two actions are identical to the priest and to the Levite. He came and is described as seeing. Where they pass by on the other side, however, the Samaritan was moved with compassion. That word in Greek, splanknidzomai, it's a strong word. To feel compassion, to yearn in one's spleen or in the bowels. The bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. Quite literally, it's a gut level compassion. That compassion, that splanknidzomai, distinguishes this passerby. He would have maintained his strict sense of tribal boundaries, and he could have continued to walk right on past the Samaritan. Instead, he chose to do something. The Samaritan is neighbor because he came close to the other and was compelled to act mercifully. Scholars agree that the English translation to show mercy is inadequate. The Samaritan did something did mercy, which was based in that deeply seated compassion of spank nidzomi. We brethren have a heritage of doing mercy and of shunning racism. In coming to America, brethren did not or were not supposed to own slaves and generally were thought to deal fairly with the Native Americans. Early on, annual meeting affirmed that no difference should be made because of skin color. Over 100 years ago, brethren were involved with work among Chinese and Japanese immigrants, and during the Civil Rights Movement, expressed both officially and unofficially, brethren supported black rights and opposition to discrimination, which we heard very clearly and colorfully in the children's time. And as we have moved to more cosmopolitan settings, there has been emphasis to work with racial and ethnic minorities. The 2007 annual conference statement, Separate No More, is a tool that was developed to work at issues of racism. But 11 years later, after its adoption, it seems that many are discouraged. On Earth Peace, the peacemaking agency of the Church of the Brethren, has an anti-racism transformation team available to resource congregations. Sadly, more than half of the congregations in our denomination have rejected the work of On Earth Peace, and last summer at annual conference, the agency came very close to being cut off from the church through a vote of the delegate body. There used to be a widely used expression, you've come a long way, baby, but no doubt we've got a long way to go. This has not been a good year for our country. We were reminded and horrified of that just this week. There were hateful, racist slurs against the people of Haiti on the very day that they were commemorating the eighth anniversary of the devastating earthquake that struck that island and took hundreds of thousands of lives. Included in those slurs were the people of Africa. To have someone in such power flippantly making racist comments gives others in our society the okay to wrap it, ramp it up there has certainly been an increase of and more active role of neo-Nazi and other white hate groups. I was grateful this week that when I called, a friend, an esteemed colleague, and a person of color was willing to sit and talk with me about racism openly and caringly, and it felt like holy ground. 
We spent time and honest conversation, and they, they are gifts for which I am deep, be, deeply grateful. As we sat together in my office, my friend kept looking over my shoulder at the poster on the wall and said, you know, I'm drawn to that prayer. The prayer on the poster is a lot like us as followers of Jesus, as people of all colors together. It indicates a movement, a journey, a sense of God's leading. And we prayed the words aloud. Lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our heart, our world, our universe. My friend explained there is danger on that journey when out of fear and mistrust, we say to the other essentially, my well-being is worth more than your dignity. When we fear or suspect the other, then we hold so tightly to what we perceive as our safety and our security, and we perpetuate racism, robbing the other of dignity. When instead we could say, your dignity is worth more than my safety, I'm willing to risk myself and my well-being to bring dignity to you. My friend then asked me if I were given a piece of paper and a crayon, how would I draw myself on that journey? What does it mean to me to be on that journey? What does it look like to do mercy, to be moved with that gut-wrenching compassion? In my imagination, I found myself on that paper with that crayon, coming alongside with an arm around an affirmation of the dignity and work, worth of my co-sojourner, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of race. That is my hope. So who is my neighbor? Like the Samaritans and Jews, there are people of various ethnic and racial backgrounds right here among us in Elizabethtown. And I wonder if at times we have been more neighborly to our sisters and brothers in Nigeria and other places around the world than we have been to people of color in our very midst. Is it easier to be neighbors to people who are far away? When have we been silent, allowing our insecurities, our suspicions, our fears to prevent us from relating to our neighbors right here? God continually invites us into personal, and collective transformation, and we can no longer be silent. It is only as we see the other, as we hear their stories, that we can know their belovedness. It is through honest, open, intentional dialogue that we can be moved by gut-wrenching compassion to make a difference. Dr. King had a dream, and we can dream too about the day when we put aside our safety for the dignity of others. What if we look for ways to dialogue openly, lovingly, with a neighbor of a different color, perhaps around those Lenten home gathering tables, or over a cup of coffee on a Sunday morning, or maybe in your office with a poster on the wall behind you? What if we make space for the other to tell their story and we respond, that's not right. And together we find a way to act with compassion. Splang zidnome, that gut-wrenching compassion. And so now we want to take an opportunity. Perhaps there are some words that you have, something stirring in your spirit. When you have experienced that gut-wrenching compassion, what if you were given a blank piece of paper and a crayon? How would you draw yourself on that journey with your neighbor?